Welcome back to Physics 246 Online. Today we're going to move into Chapter 4 in Bevington's book and introduce formally the method of maximum likelihood. And the goal of this method is to find the parameters of the parent population of a set of data that our sample population is most likely to have come from. And remember, the parent population is this hypothetical infinite set of measurements that could have been done of a particular quantity. Our sample population is simply a finite set of all those data. So back in chapter one, to review, we defined the mean of a sample population in the familiar equation shown here. And we're going to call this mu prime for this chapter in order to distinguish it from the hypothetical mean of the parent population. Again, uh, the mean, if we knew all of the infinite set of measurements that could be made of this parent population, the mean would be easy to calculate. So what we're going to try to do is figure out what is the most probable value of the mean of the parent population that we can extract from our sample, pop sample population. In chapter one, we merely asserted what the result was. We said that the mean of the sample population was simply the best estimate of the mean of the parent population. But we're going to actually go ahead and demonstrate formally that there is a way of maintaining that that's actually true. So that was the assertion that we made, but we're going to demonstrate now that this is actually the most probable estimate of the mean of the true parent population. So, in order to do this, we're going to assume that we have a Gaussian distribution in our set of measurements. The parent population then corresponds to a Gaussian distribution, and that that Gaussian distribution is characterized by a mean mu and a standard deviation sigma. <clears throat> and if that's the case, then the probability of making a measurement x sub i from this distribution is given by the familiar form of the Gaussian distribution. So, what we can do then, that's the probability of making any one single measurement. What we want to do now, though, is estimate the, uh, excuse me, no, uh, what we want to do, first of all, is use our data to get the best estimates, mu prime and sigma prime, of the true values for the parent population, mu and sigma. So, we're going to assume for simplicity that the width of the sample population is a very good estimate of the width of the parent population. So this sigma prime, uh, we will assume, uh, calculated from our sample set, is approximately the sigma of the parent distribution. Now, the probability of making, as we said just a minute ago, the probability of making a measurement x sub i when the mean of the sample population is mu prime and the standard deviation is sigma goes like this. Now, what we do when we make um, a set of measurements is we're constructing this sample set of measurements out of the entire parent population. So let's say we make 100 measurements. That means we've got 100 different values of this x sub i that we get from our 100 trials. And the probability of getting all 100 of those values is just the product of the individual probabilities of getting any one of the individual values. And so you may have seen before, <clears throat> as distinct from the summation notation, the sigma notation that tells us the sum of a bunch of terms, pi is the symbol that we use, a capital Greek letter pi, to indicate the probabilities, the products of the probabilities. So from this expression, what we mean is the product of the probability of getting any individual measurement x sub i summed up over all of the measurements that we actually obtained in our sample. And when we plug in the expression for that Gaussian probability and then take the product from i equals 1 to n, the coefficient out in front, of course, since it's there in all of the n terms, that just gets raised to the nth power. And then each of these individual probabilities has an exponential term. Well, when we take the product of exponentials, we end up with the exponential of the sum of all of the terms that are in the exponent. <clears throat> so you can show that if we just go back to 
this expression here, and we take the products of all of those terms, we end up simply with the exponential of the sum of all the terms that were in the exponent. So now here's the way that the method of maximum likelihood works. Supposing that we tried all different possible values of mu prime, right, that could potentially be considered as candidates for the mean of the parent population. And for each of those values of mu prime, we would have a different value for this product of all of the probabilities. We maximize the probability as a function of this mu prime by varying the mu prime for our sample set until we get the maximum value. So that's the expression for that probability. And if we can maximize this, if we can take the derivative and set it equal to 0, <clears throat> then our assumption is that that's equivalent. Having the maximum probability would be uh, that, that that gives us the value of mu prime that's most likely to be consistent with the parent population. So that's not too difficult to do, actually. Here is this product of all the probabilities of obtaining the values x sub i from 1 to n for this mu prime. And what we're trying to do with this, we're trying to maximize this overall probability and then use that to solve for mu prime. So to maximize the probability, since the probability is just a constant out in front, times this exponential term, since it's a negative exponent, we need to minimize the exponent. All right, so the, the larger the exponent, since it's negative, the smaller the probability will be. Well, correspondingly, if we make this exponent as small as possible, then we'll maximize what the probability is. So we'll call this term x, and this idea of finding the uh, maximum value of the probability corresponds then to minimizing this value of x. And since this x value is a sum of squared terms, what we're doing is sometimes called the least squares method. It's the method of trying to find the smallest possible sum of all those squared terms. So that means we take the derivative of this quantity x with respect to mu prime, and we will extract the derivative of that, set it equal to 0. And when we do, we get the value for mu prime that is the familiar result, 1 over n times the sum of all the x sub i values. And that's just the mean value of x. And this must seem really pointless, because we didn't we know already that this was the case? Well, we assumed back in our initial study of error analysis, we assumed that the mean value is the best estimate of the mean value of the parent population. But now we have a much more formal and rigorous justification for that result. So we know how to calculate then the mean of our sample set, which now we have proven is most likely to be the result for the mean of the parent population. So now the question is, What's the error in that mean value mu prime that we just calculated? What's the error in the mean value of x? And we'll go back to chapter 3 and use our error propagation equation as the starting point here. We'll assume that each of the individual x sub i measurements are independent of one another. And so there will not be any covariance term here. We will simply sum up for each of our data points sigma i squared. Of course, that's the, you know, sigma i is the uncertainty in that measurement, times the partial of mu prime with respect to that xi measurement, quantity squared. And we'll sum this up over all the individual data points. Well, now, since we have an expression for mu prime, which is the same thing as our mean value of x, we can calculate this partial derivative, square it, and then add up all these terms. So we'll assume, for the moment, that each measurement has the same uncertainty in it, so that all these sigma i's will just be the same. <clears throat> and then we know the expression for mu prime. When we take the partial with respect to xi, what we get is, of course, 1 over n, and then the partial with respect to xi of the sum of all of the xi's. So for all of terms in that sum except for 1, the derivative will be 0. The derivative will only be non-zero for j equal to i. And there, the derivative will just be 1. 
So when we take that partial derivative, we're just going to get 1 over n uh, times the partial, which is 1. So partial mu prime with respect to xi will be 1 over n. That gets squared up here. So our result, since each of these terms in the sum from i equals 1 to n will be 1 over n, we'll, we will have n of those terms. And so when the smoke clears, we get a result for sigma mu prime, when we take the square root, that's equal to the sigma of the population over the square root of n. And it's important to understand the difference between these two sigmas. The sigma in the numerator on the right-hand side is the overall standard deviation of the entire set of data. Sigma mu prime is the error in the mean. And that then, if we quote, if we do repeated measurements of a certain quantity x sub i and we want to quote our best report for that result, we would take the mean value plus or minus the error in the mean. And so this shows how repeated measurements, making n larger and larger and larger, tends to reduce the error in that mean value. Now, to finish up our discussion of this part of chapter 4, let's just consider what if the uncertainties in our individual measurements of this quantity x sub i are not all equal to each other. And that could happen depending on the instrumentation or the method of measurement that we use. For example, if we're taking measurements, let's say, of some kind of a voltage, and somewhere along the line, the value of the voltage jumps up just a little bit so that now we might be on a different scale for the voltmeter setting that we're using to measure those voltages, we may then have an extra digit of precision in the readout that we're using. And that then implies that the uncertainty in those measurements could be different depending on, in this case, the scale of the meter that we're using. So those sigmas we're going to leave in our individual result uh, for the probabilities that we used. We're going to call those individual uh, uncertainties sigma sub i. And because they're not the same for all of our measurements, x sub i, we should weight the measurements that have smaller uncertainties more than the measurements with larger uncertainties. And what we're going to do now is show how to handle the more general case where the uncertainties in the measurements that form part of our data set are not all the same. The strategy is the same. We're going to construct this quantity P, the probability of getting all of the set of measurements that we've made, and then the exponent, which is this X term, we're going to minimize, which again leads to the method of least squares. So our X value is just a little bit different now because we don't pull the sigma sub i uh, outside the summation as just 1 over sigma. We leave it inside here because it's different for the different data points. So if we go back to our definition of x and then take the derivative with respect to mu prime, we get this quantity here. And I'm not going to show all of the results uh, of how to get the final answer. But you can see here the first step when you take the derivative of this term, because you're taking the derivative of a sum, you just get the sum of the derivatives. The factor of 2 in the exponent comes down in front. And then, because we're taking the derivative uh, with respect to mu prime, we get a minus 1 over sigma that comes outside of taking the derivative of what's in the parentheses. And the minus sign cancels the minus sign that was in x to start with. So we take that derivative, we set it equal to 0, and then we're going to have to expand this sum. And when we do that, we can actually solve for the mu value that satisfies the equation. And the mu value <clears throat> ends up being the ratio of these two sums. So the numerator sum is the sum of all the x measurements, but in this case, divided by the uncertainties in each of those measurements. The denominator is the sum of 1 over the uncertainty squared. So this is now our more general value for the mean value of our sample. Notice that if the sigma i's are the same, if they're all the same, then a 1 over sigma squared gets pulled out of each of these sums. They cancel out, and we end up with the same expression that we had before for the mean value of our set of data. So what we're going to do to simplify the notation just a little bit, since this factor of 1 over sigma squared uh, comes into both of these sums, we're going to call that a weight. And it makes sense to call it a weight because 1 over sigma squared is what gets multiplied by each of the individual x values in the numerator sum. So 
the smaller sigma i is, the larger the weighting assigned to that particular value of the measurement. So w sub i will define to be 1 over sigma i squared, which makes this sum just a little bit easier uh, to write down. So it becomes the sum from i equals 1 to n of the weight multiplied by the value divided by the sum of all the weights. So this gives us now the way to calculate the weighted mean when our individual measurements have different uncertainties. But the last step then is to estimate what the uncertainty uh, is in that mean value. How much does each of the data points contribute to the uncertainty? So we go back once again to equation 313 that has this familiar, familiar form. And the sigma sub i, those are all different from each other. But what we can do to simplify the notation, realize that that you know, 1 over sigma i squared is the weight. So sigma i squared is 1 over the weight. And then here is the partial derivative that we have to take of the expression for mu prime given here in the brackets. And we've got to take that partial and then square it. And in class, uh, we'll show exactly where this comes from. But the result is, when everything simplifies, that for the variance in this mean value, we get simply 1 over the sum of all the weights. And therefore, if we wanted to find what the uncertainty is in the mean, we would take the square root of that quantity there. So this is equivalent. If we go back and substitute in for what the weight means, it means that we have 1 over this sum of 1 over sigma i squared. So it's, it's not too difficult uh, to do these calculations, assuming that we have a set of data points and a set of uncertainties that are associated with them. And you'll get some practice doing this on the homework assignment for this week. So I hope this has been a useful introduction to Chapter 4, how we deal with the maximum likelihood method for estimating the mean and the uncertainty in a set of data, and I will see you in class.